you don't know the rest of the words of the song, you can do that last one. Lie, 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 lie. It's one that feel like uh, kind of dancing, dancing. So, praise his name, amen. I'm training my sorrows, I'm training my shame. I know in uh, my Sunday school class we're talking about through uh, whatever trials to have pure joy, consider that pure joy, uh, great joy. And that's a hard thing to grasp, I think, uh, whether you're 16 or 60. The idea that when you have uh, those trials, but that song talking about trading those for the joy of the Lord, praise His name. We ask Him today to reign in us over all the earth. Over all the earth, you reign on us.
show you how long that would take. Um, I don't think we have time. Uh, Psalm 84, verses 1 through 4. This is very relevant to the next song we're going to sing, as you will see. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. He is sparrow. Lord Almighty, my King, my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Are you someone who is ever praising God? How about the earlier part? My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. The opportunity to come before Him, to stand before Him. Uh, what an amazing, amazing uh, thing to contemplate. How lovely is the Lord's dwelling place.
eternity in your court, in your presence. Father, I thank you and praise you for the truth of that word. I thank you for the opportunity to sing about it here this morning and to proclaim you, Lord, to exalt you on high. Lord, reign in us today that we would be able to have the boldness be able to state that you are the one true God, Lord. That you, Father, reign and ruler over all of the earth. Lord, but this begins with me. Help me to understand that you reign and rule over me. And what that means to my choices in my life. And how I live each day in fullness with you, Lord, at the, at the helm of the I thank you and praise you that you are the everlasting God. Amen. Strength will rise as we wait upon him. Strength will rise.
help me to give back to a world in need. Help me to not just, uh, Lord, help me to not just be a fat Christian that just soaks it all in and doesn't give it up. So I'm going to give it away. Give everything that you've given to me. Give it away, Lord. The most important piece is Jesus Christ. Lord, you are my name. I praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.
just give you all the praise and the honor and glory. We thank you so much for your incredible love that you would send Jesus to become our Savior. In his name, amen. Would the children come forward for children's church? <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time, Lord. We just thank you that we can look at your word now. Um, Lord, I pray for each one of us here today that you would um, just open our hearts and minds to hear from you today, Lord. And, um, we know you have a special a special message for each one of us today, Lord, an appointment for us to be here. We pray that we would pay close attention now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I like that personal reminder, Pastor Corey, that uh, this is God's appointment for us right now today. All right, we've finished Ezra. So now we're going to go into Nehemiah. And some of you have heard the old joke that he was one of the shortest men in the Bible. Bill that is probably the shortest because he was just a shoe height. And this guy was just Nehemiah. Okay, now that I got that out of my system, let's go on. Okay. As, as we look at this new book here, it's helpful to get a little background information just to kind of bring us up to speed here. You remember that in Ezra, you had this fellow by the name of Zerubbabel, and that's kind of one of those fun names you just like to pronounce every now and again. He and Joshua had gone back to Jerusalem with about 50,000 of God's chosen people to rebuild the temple. And the temple had been rebuilt, and then about 70 years after the initial return, Ezra had led the people to experience revival. So you've got Zerubbabel and Joshua, and then you've got Ezra coming into the picture. Now we're going to see Nehemiah as he goes to Jerusalem about 14 years later. The book of Nehemiah also helps you and me to see that God did indeed fulfill the restoration of those who came back to his land that he given to them to come out of Babylon. Now this book is also an historical narrative, but please remember, it's inspired by the Spirit of God. It's not just someone putting down observations and facts, yes it is, that sort of thing, but it's inspired by the Spirit of God, so every word contained within it is God's Word. It's not like a geography book or a history book or something like that. The focus here is on the faithfulness of and holiness of God. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? And that's what we need to be reminded of regularly, of God's faithfulness and His holiness to His people. Now the first part of the book deals mostly with the actual rebuilding of the walls of the city. You see, the temple had to be taken care of first because that was the whole point, God's people worshiping Him. But now this is God's city, and so you want to have the temple walls built up, or not the temple, but the city walls built up around that area. And as it often happens, Nehemiah probably would not have chosen and said, yep, I'd like to go do something for God, but the reality is God chose to use him in this rebuilding of the walls. And that happens quite often in our own lives. Now today, the main thing that I want for us to establish in our minds is that prayer keeps our focus where it needs to be. Okay? Some of you are thinking, well, now Pastor Kenny, I'm kind of a hobby horse here. He changed the whole focus. You know, instead of pie, we're now prayer focused. He's been talking about prayer here and there and everywhere else. Sorry, guys. That seems to be where God's taking us. And, and in my own life, I understand that struggle. And I hope you understand that struggle in your own life. The reality is prayer is indeed where our focus needs to be. Okay? Well, uh, you don't have to just kind of ignore some of the things that are happening on PowerPoint. Whoever said Microsoft works, <laughs> they did an automatic update again this week. And so 
Thank you, Jeff, for your willingness to put up with what comes up there. So it's going to be up there, but it may not be quite the way I want it to be or the way Jeff wants it to be. First of all, we're going to see that a prayerful person has concern for other people. A prayerful person has concern for others. Okay, So you should have an outline in your bulletins. Have your Bibles open to Nehemiah. We're going to go through chapters 1 and 2 today. I'm not going to read through all the verses, but we're going to touch upon several verses. So right away, verse 1, da-da, we're introduced to Nehemiah. Okay, We're introduced to this author of this book. Now scholars suggest that if you look at Nehemiah and read through it, and if you read through it a few times, which I like to do, I like to read through about five to eight times before I even start my sermon series, it's like a journal, it's like a diary. It's a very in-depth, personal book written by Nehemiah. It's kind of interesting. Uh, as you look at this, it's very personal. But again, it's inspired by the Spirit of God. Okay, These are God's words through Nehemiah. Now the word Nehemiah, the name actually means the Lord comforts. It's interesting. Our name is important. Yes. Don't name any of your daughters Jezebel. A, that's probably not the best name. And it seems quite appropriate that Nehemiah is named thusly, because we're going to see that God is going to use Nehemiah to comfort and encourage a very discouraged people. And he wants to help them to understand God is going to fulfill his promises to his people. Now the first set of chapters, for those of you that like grammar, there's about two or three of us, uh, the first seven chapters are written in the first person. You know what the first person is. I, me, that sort of thing. Okay. It's not all about Nehemiah, but he's writing it from his perspective here. You can almost, as you read through it, you can almost imagine that you're sitting down at Tim Hortons and there's Nehemiah there with a donut and coffee talking with you. Yeah, and he would have a donut and coffee, I'm sure. Yeah. So he's just sitting there visiting with you and you're getting his perspective from him. Also in chapter 12, verse 31, through all of chapter 13, it goes back to first person again. Now if we look ahead into Nehemiah 11 and 12, and I know this is kind of an overview, but it helps us to establish some things, understand some things. It's almost as if we're peering into the very core of who Nehemiah was as a person. You get to see what makes him tick, as it, as it were. We, we see that he was a very skilled organizer. He was a very skilled planner. He probably could have taught the Franklin Covey Corporation a few things about time management and leadership skills. Uh, incredible abilities that we will see that he has. But even though he was a skilled organizer and a great planner, he has seemed to have an incredible amount of energy, he also relied very heavily upon God. Okay? Now, I, I believe that that ought to be an encouragement to us. Because so often within Christianity, we tend to say, it's all, I'm going to sit back and let it all be on God's shoulders. Or we go on the other and say, man, if I don't do it, it's not going to get done. Okay? And I believe the two ought to be combined. It's all up to God, but I need to be obedient and do everything I can, like Paul says, with His power, which works in me. Okay? So we're going to see a lot of that working here. He's in Susa, not to be compared with a large brass instrument. He is uh, in the city of Susa, which was the capital city. It was the winter residence for the kings at the time. And interestingly, just a little trivia for those of you who have gone through Esther, this is probably where a lot of that stuff took place. Esther was in the city of Susa, which was the winter residence there. Okay? In verse 2, family gathering, his brother comes to visit. And I find it very interesting here that when his brother comes to visit, Nehemiah asks him questions about his fellow Jews and all those activities that are taking place in Jerusalem. And why is that interesting to me? Because it's not about Nehemiah, it's not even about his brother. Nehemiah is showing an incredibly active, intense concern for his brothers and sisters that are far away. And they're going back to a tough situation. And that ought to encourage and challenge us as well. We need to be praying and concerned about brothers and sisters who are 
not immediately part of our church family. Yeah, we get too concerned about that. But think about those outside our church family, all around the world, brothers and sisters in Christ. Now the answer given to Nehemiah in verse 3 is not at all encouraging. You see a picture of a very disheartened people. Listen to what he says. That they are in great distress and reproach, and the wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. How are you doing? Everybody is in a state of depression. We're sure we're not pleasing to God. In fact, I'd really rather you not come over right now because the place is an absolute mess. Now, how would you and I respond to comments about that? Like that, about our brothers and sisters. Well, let's look at what Nehemiah's response is in verses 4 through 11. We see in this section that a prayerful person communicates correctly with God. A prayerful person communicates correctly with God. Now, please don't get me wrong here. I'm not suggesting that to pray to God, you have to be a wordsmith. I, I'm not suggesting that to pray to God, you've got to have all your theology absolutely accurate and correct. And some of you know I am a little bit picky on some of those things. However, pray to God. Talk to Him. Period. Okay? But I am convinced, and we talked about this even in Sunday school, that many Christians struggle with prayer because they don't have a close enough relationship with God to truly know to whom they're praying. It's like going up to a total stranger sometimes. Our relationship ought to be close enough to Him that we can communicate properly. Oftentimes Christians will pray in anger. Sometimes we will pray in a very demanding way. I want what I want yesterday. Or the infamous give me patience now. Which, wow, that's right. <laughs> Think about that one. Or we pray in a self-righteous way. Lord, why did that person get thus and so? And they live like that. And you know how I live, God. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should think about that statement. He knows how we are. Or maybe some Christians just pray and treat God as if He's just one of us. And folks, He isn't. He isn't. He is God. He is above all. We see in these verses that Nehemiah had a very deep relationship with God. And he understood the importance and the power of this communication. So when he heard this report about this very discouraged group of God's children, we see Ezra, it says, weeping and mourning and fasting and praying. You know, there were no just weeping and. Just and, 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 and. But he didn't just simply sit down and become reflective and introspective. He did this all before the God of heaven. In other words, he knew where he needed to be. He needed to be in God's very presence, communicating with God. Now, think about this for a second. He hears about this report about this group of God's children that are his brothers and sisters, as it were, fellow Jews. They're 700 some miles away. Now, it would have been very easy for Nehemiah to say, that's too bad. Nothing I can do about it. That's 700 miles away. I can't. What can I do? Or he could have thought, hey, too bad for them. Look where I am. I am living in the land of luxury. I have anything I can ever ask for. In fact, I've even got the king's eating. I'm his cupbearer. We'll find that out later, of course. But even though he was far removed from that locale, he understood this situation impacted God's people. So if it impacts God's people, it's going to impact him. Remember what Jesus said? Mourn with those who mourn. Rejoice with those who rejoice. 
When someone else is going through hard times, it impacts us. When someone's going through good times, it ought to impact us. So he's about to engage God in prayer. By the way, I, I, I'm kind of weird, I understand that. But I, I went to look through to see how many prayers that there were in Nehemiah because as I was reading, I'm going, seems like I've heard some of this before. There's actually nine prayers that I counted in Nehemiah. So I'm going, hmm, short book, prayer must be important. In fact, it begins with a prayer and it ends with a prayer. And I had to ask myself, is my life like that? Am I known as a person who prays because I know my need for that incredibly close communication and connection with God? Verse 5, we get to listen in on this prayer. I, I love how the Spirit of God caused Nehemiah to write this down. He begins, he says, I beseech you, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who preserves the covenant and loving kindness for those who love Him and keep His commandments. Now, in just that short verse, doesn't that sound a little bit like the prayer that Jesus taught the disciples? By the way, he's recognizing who God is. Our Father, who is in heaven. Holy is your name. It's, he's not just one of us guys. He's the creator of all that there is. He is far removed from us, even though He is present with us. Now try to wrap your brain around that one. That, that's kind of a fun one. For anyone who truly knows God, you and I can agree that He is the great and awesome God. If you know God, you know He is great. You know He is awesome. He is not fickle. He is not arbitrary. He's God. There is none like Him. He is the faithful one who keeps His promises. Also, notice He starts out the prayer like this. I see this as incredibly important. You start out prayer with praise. Then you put a petition. You don't start asking start out praising. Warren Wiersbe one time made the comment as we went through the acrostic of pray, praise, repentance, asking for others, and then yourself. He says there's a lot of Christians that spend a lot of time yarping and got it upside down. It's all about me. Okay, let's talk about this person. Oh, by the way, I want to tell you about this. Oh, thank you, Lord. You're so wonderful. Folks, if you and I don't recognize the holiness and the great awesomeness of God, why are we praying? Why would you even ask Him of anything if you don't acknowledge who He is? Verse 6, Nehemiah begins a specific request. He asks God to pay attention to what He has to say. Now, it's not like, remember little children with a little and you're talking away with someone else and you're holding a little child and you go, Mommy, Daddy, you know, whoever's holding the child, and you're still talking away because you know eventually you're going to get to that child and all of a sudden you feel their hands on both sides of your face and you're pulled over there. <laughs> yes, dear, what do you want? Okay. Uh, that's not what Nehemiah is saying. He's not saying that God's so busy and so incredibly distracted that God, pay attention to me. No, it's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, I acknowledge the incredible seriousness of this prayer, and I want to just, my focus is on you, God, right now. Okay? It's not about God getting his act together. It's about that recognition that Nehemiah says, I'm not going to be distracted by anything right now. It's just you and me, God. I want to have your attention this time. He says he's doing it not just once, but how often? Day and night. Day and night. What specifically is he praying? Well, the obvious issue that presents itself is confession of sin. That's interesting. So often we want without making things right. We want God's blessing without acknowledging that He's right about our sin. It starts out with confession of sin. I, and just like Ezra, I am amazed. He identifies with the people. 
He's not saying, well, God, I don't know what's going on with those people, but I'm sure there's a bunch of sin in their lives. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying, God, you know, I've been over here, and I've been doing what you want here with the king. I, I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing, God. But I'm going to come to you on their behalf. That's not what he's saying. He says, we have sinned. We. He's including himself in that. Folks, we're not lily white, are we? We're not pure. And if the truth be told, maybe we didn't do some of that other stuff. But we've got sin in our own minds. And folks, any sin is an abomination to God. Any sin is an affront to Him. He understood that He was part of the larger community. Folks, the sooner you and I recognize our own propensity to sin, the quicker we will be able to understand God's absolute holiness and righteousness. And when we understand God's holiness and righteousness, then we can get down to business. Again, confession of sin cannot be generic. Look at verse 7. He lists some specifics. He says, We have acted very corruptly against you. We have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Folks, do not be generic when you pray. Be very specific. Name the sin. Because Satan knows the sin. <coughs> and Satan's going to do whatever he can to trip you up with it. You have to acknowledge before God that specific sin. Name it. He names it. Otherwise, you're just being very generic. It's like my children come up to me and say, I'm sorry, Dad. And I'll say, sorry for what? Tell me, what are you apologizing about? Is it like I don't know? Of course I know. But they're not going to understand that this is a wrong act. This particular thing was wrong and inappropriate and unacceptable. It has to be dealt with. You and I can pray to a blue in the face, Lord, forgive me for my sins. What does that mean? Unless you know specifically what it is and you agree with God that that is sin, how do you know what to surrender to Him? How do you know when He's done a work in your life when that gets resolved? Nehemiah named it very specifically. Also, when you and I are generic about our sin, we become hardened towards God's holiness and His righteousness. And when you and I do not acknowledge our sin specifically, we lose our testimony to the world around us. We need to be specific. As we look at verse 8, it almost appears like Nehemiah is saying, Oh, by the way, God, did you remember? It's like Nehemiah is reminding God, but that's not what he's doing. He's using this wording the way it is, remembering himself these promises. And you know that Nehemiah was a man of God. You know that he knew God's word. Listen to what he says. He says, If, this is God's words, Nehemiah is reciting God's words. If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the Gentile peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, those of you who have been scattered were in the most remote part of heaven, I will gather from there and I will bring them to the place where I have chosen to cause my name to dwell. What Nehemiah has done is he is remembering what God had shared centuries earlier back in the book of Deuteronomy. Chapters 30, chapter 12, chapter 9, it's all found in those three chapters. He's reciting this. By the way, anybody here sometimes wonder, I don't know what to pray. I, I sometimes, sometimes I'm in a situation where I don't know what to pray. Pray scripture. Pray scripture. For many of us, it's the Psalms. Sometimes it's Romans 12. Sometimes Romans 6. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so the sin may increase? By no means. You know, the V8 moment. Sometimes it's Ephesians 1. For we are sealed by 
by means of the Holy Spirit, guaranteeing our inheritance until the day of redemption. I don't know what the situation is that you might find yourself in, but sometimes just praying scripture illumines our minds. We begin to see God more clearly at that point. Pray with humility also. That goes without saying, but I said it anyway. In verse 10, we see that Nehemiah recognizes that God's chosen people have been taken care of by God through His great power and by your strong hand. Isn't that cool? They've been taken care of all these years. Not only are these Jews God's chosen people, they're His servants. Again, we mentioned this in Sunday School this morning as well. You and I are not just saved for heaven, as it were, to be in the presence of Christ. You and I were chosen to be His children, but we're also chosen to be His servants, His slaves. In verse 11, we see Nehemiah pleading with God, letting God know how much He loves Him. And the main request at this point is that Nehemiah would be given success by God before the great king, Artaxerxes. Now, without any Bible knowledge, we might ask ourselves the question, what is a Jew doing with King Artaxerxes? That is, how did that happen? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. God put him there. God put him there. And in verse 11, he says, Now I was cupbearer to the king. Cupbearer, what does that mean? His responsibility was to taste the wine before any banquet of any sort to make sure that someone hadn't slipped in any poison. There was an era when there was such a turnover because assassination after assassination after assassination, they finally got wise and said, we need a cupbearer, cup someone that, you know, is going to take the dive. It's the earliest secret service. <laughs> Will you take a bullet? No, but I'll take the wine. And if it was poison, he didn't take it. Now that means he's someone who's trusted. Because who's to say that the cup bear wouldn't slip something in there? The king trusted Nehemiah implicitly. And as a result, oftentimes the cup bear was known to be one of the closest confidants of the king from heaven. How do you get in that situation? Thank you. God put him there. Thirdly, a prayerful person is convinced of God's direction. A prayerful person is convinced of God's direction. I didn't think about this, but it's a little bit, wasn't it? As we look at verse 1, we wonder why Nehemiah mentions another month, especially since we have no idea what those months mean, unless you're a Hebrew scholar. For most of us, these, these months just look like strange words. But what it does let us know is that the events that are about to take place took place four months after he began praying. Anybody feel like God takes a long time to answer your prayers? He was praying night and day for four months. That's pretty powerful. Why? What's so important about that? As I look at that, I'm, I'm thinking, you know something? I'm not a patient person. And sometimes I do the proverbial going where angels fear to tread. That's really cool. Sometimes we just need to sit back and say, God, you let me know when the timing's right. And you and I know, we, we know what that feels like when the timing's right. God gives us an urgency or He gives us a prodding. There's something within our spirit. If we're in the right relationship with Him as we should be, we'll know. In verse 1, he's taking the wine to the king and he prefaces his encounter with the king by saying, Now I have not been sad in his presence. Okay then. So you haven't been sad in his presence. Why would you say anything about this, Nehemiah? Who cares? You're just tasting the wine to make sure that he's not poisoned. Well, you ought to care. Because if your countenance was down, if you were showing that you weren't Mr. Turkey, if you will, 
you were in for troubles. You would be dismissed, maybe permanently. They, they didn't fool around. They don't want down people. That's why I believe, in verse 2 he says, then I was very much afraid. <laughs> I was very much afraid. Because the king notices this, and you understand why the king would notice that, even if you try to hide it? Because he knows you well. You're there every time to check the wine. Verse 2 asks the question by the king with a very discerning observation. Why is your face sad though you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of heart. Now remember, Ezra had been praying night and day for God's people. He would also been praying that the king would have a compassionate spirit when the time was right. And now, God has opened the door with the king's question. You ever experience that? You say, Lord, I need to do thus and so. I really feel like you would do thus and so, but I don't know when. And all of a sudden, that person will ask you that leading question. You're going, uh -huh. it's now. It's now. This is the time. So, verse 3, Nehemiah describes the specifics after giving homage to the king. He says, let the king live forever. Folks, that's just a natural protocol. That's how you answer the king. Let the king live forever. And then he says, why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies desolate and its gates have been consumed by fire? So Nehemiah spoke properly with the courtesy he's supposed to, and he presented the situation, and more than likely he probably had the king's sympathy at this point. Because you start talking about honor, you start talking about your ancestry, it's not about you, it's about all this other stuff. Now, he didn't know what kind of response the king was going to give. He'd been praying, but he also knew his history, and he knew a lot of people had been killed because they were living for God. So how's he going to respond? So the king comes up with a question which shows that he was quite favorable towards Nehemiah. He said, what would you request? That's pretty cool. What would you now if it were me, Mr. Plan it all out beforehand, I'd reach into my pocket, pull out my list and sit here. That's not what Nehemiah did. Now I'm guessing Nehemiah probably had a list. Why do I say that? Because he's praying night and day. He was in close communication with God. So he probably had a list. We're going to see that that's probably very true a little bit later on. But we see in the last part of verse 4 the proper response. And that is, so I pray to the God of heaven. What would you request? So I pray to the God of heaven. You mean you didn't pull out a list and say, here it is, check it over, do what you can? I pray to the God of heaven. Wouldn't that be nice if every one of us would do that? Rather than just going off and just blurting, we pray. We talk to God about it. Now, I, I have to caution us. Don't expect a short prayer to be of any benefit unless you've been praying on a regular basis. Okay? Foxhole prayers sometimes work. The reality is you and I won't even be thinking about a short prayer unless we've been in constant communication with God. So you want wisdom? Oh, James says what, Dean? That's next week. That's next week. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself here. And ask God. Ask God. I like it. You're, you're going to James? That's good. Maybe I'll sit in my class. So every time an opportunity or challenge comes our way, bring it to God. Bring it to God. One writer said, praying must be as much of a habit as breathing. It should be second nature. How many of you thought about breathing when you woke up this morning? I was thinking about coughing. I didn't think about breathing. Shouldn't prayer be just like that? Such an essential part of our lives that we wouldn't think 
I'm not praying. Now, verse 5, Nehemiah responds by asking if he can go back to Jerusalem to help rebuild the city. That's a pretty bold request for someone whose responsibility was to make sure the king didn't get killed by poisoning. I also find it kind of humorous that in all this praying, you know what God was doing in Nehemiah's life? Preparing him to be the one in charge. Here am I, said Paul. Here am I, said Mike. You know, no, he's just talking to God this whole time saying, Lord, we need your help, we need your wisdom, blah, blah, blah. And God's been preparing him this whole time. So, God had prepared. And why do I know God prepared it? Because Nehemiah has a time frame that presents this list. So he says, this, 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 and it should take me this much time. Verse 6 is quite interesting because he says the queen was right beside the king. Who cares? What's so important about that? Well, because the queen did not normally show herself at public events. Remember the book of Esther? The king had to send for his queen because it was a big, huge public party. Okay? But the private family celebrations, the queen was there. So he lets us know this is kind of a private in-house thing. It's not up for discussion with everybody. So Nehemiah gave a very specific time. And he also asked for letters showing that the king had given him permission to go. And you know from verse 9 that the king had been favorable towards all this because he sent along an army and horsemen. And Nehemiah didn't go as a servant. Nehemiah went as a governor. That's quite a promotion. So Nehemiah had fought through this pretty well, which lets us know, don't forsake planning and simply say, I'm just trusting God. Remember earlier? Planning and trust can go hand in hand. They ought to. Plan well. And if God needs to adjust it, He will, if you're leaning upon Him. Again, we look at verse 10. We're going to see it come up a little bit later. But whenever God's people choose to do God's business, there's opposition. So verse 4, a prayer, or we got verse 4. Number 4, a prayerful person knows who is in control. A prayerful person knows who is in control. Okay? In these verses, this is in verses 11 to 20, we see events that took place after Nehemiah had arrived in Jerusalem. We don't see the whole journey because it's taken a few months. And as we look at this, Nehemiah is very proactive in the process. He had some research that he needed to do before he went public with all this. If you look at verse 12, you get the idea that he did not share all of his plans with the people. There's some wisdom to that. You want to be prepared. You want to be wise. You want to make sure this is God's direction so you don't get the people stirred up unnecessarily. In fact, he began his inspection under the cover of darkness at night. It was only him and a few other people and one animal carrying him. As he went around the walls of Jerusalem, all he found were broken down walls and gates that had been burned and destroyed by fire. In fact, it was so bad that one place this animal couldn't even get through. And as you think about this, you're saying, well, now, there was revival under Ezra. They rebuilt the temple. What's this from? This goes way back to when Nebuchadnezzar came the third time and destroyed the city. He sacked it, as it were. In verse 16, we see Nehemiah back with the leaders. They had to realize he'd gone out that night to check everything that was going on. Verse 17, we see this is the time to present the project to the people. And listen, he gives a very succinct evaluation and a solution. Listen to what he says. You see the bad situation we are in. Didn't say you guys. We are in. The Jerusalem is desolate and its gates are burned by fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. He didn't go into a detailed report. He didn't go into a cost analysis. He didn't describe. It's not necessary. Very plain and simple. We're in a bad situation. Here's what it is. Jerusalem desolate. Place looks like a pit. He identified with the people. We 
are in a bad situation. He summarized the problem. He showed the seriousness of the problem. Then he proposed a solution that had a definite action. Let us rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Why? Why should we do this that we may no longer be a reproach? And it wasn't anything to do with the neighbors and it had everything to do with God. You see, if God bringing his people back and reestablishing them, wouldn't he want the city to reflect that? I like how he was concerned about God's glory. Back in verse 18, he brings the focus back to God in the summer. He testifies before all the leaders how God had provided, how God had protected, how God had moved the king's heart. And as a result, they said, pronouns are important, not he, they said, let us arise and build. Whoa, how that happened. Four months of prayer. A man of God who was willing to listen to God, who was willing to act for God. But that didn't stop with their words. They didn't say, oh, that's a great idea, let's build. Let's build. It says, then they put their hands to the good work. We don't just encourage one another by saying wonderful things about God, do we? We say wonderful things about God when we get in there and do something with Him. There's a whole lot more encouragement when others see God in action through us. Isn't there? Aren't you lifted up and built up? I, I had somebody used to share with me a couple of stories and went, whoa, this is awesome. God's good. God's at work. God is active. People are being obedient, responsive. Sadly, again, when God's people make a decision to be obedient to Him, opposition. It's not always people. But here it is, people, who are the antagonists towards Nehemiah and his fellow Jews. Those two individuals mentioned in verse 10 are seen again in verse 19 with another leader from the nearby area. And when these individuals heard what was about to take place in the rebuilding of the city, they it says, they mocked us and despised us and said, what is this thing you're doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Isn't that the way the enemy often behaves? False accusations. Imputing false motives to us. You see, when there's no legitimate reason to oppose, the enemy will resort to these kind of tactics. Christians are haters simply because we present God's word. Really? That's a false accusation. But to shut us down, quiet us. That comes out that way. But don't you love how Nehemiah responds? He doesn't give them any merit to their comments. He doesn't acknowledge the fact that they're lying through their teeth. He doesn't answer them according to the leading questions. In fact, if the truth be known, it's none of their business. But what he does do, by the way, he didn't even show the documentation to prove that he was doing what he was supposed to. Now that's the first thing I would have done. Hey, you just a, here's the paperwork, buddy. Nehemiah didn't do that. What does he do? It says, the God of heaven will give us success. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build, but you have no portion, right, or memorial in Jerusalem. He pointed out God's role in this whole process. In other words, he could have easily said, we belong to God, you don't. Back off. Now that we can memorize, right? But he said, we belong to God, you don't. That's pretty strong stuff. But there was a reason for it. Those antagonists were mixing their worship with God with worship of false gods and paganism. Folks, you can't have it that way. You either belong to Jesus Christ, you live for Him, or you belong to Satan in the world. You can't have both. That's what Nehemiah is saying. We will not let God's name be tainted by taking help from you. And sure, they might have been very helpful if you look at the role they could have played, but the reality was, He would not allow them to be part of it. So as we look back through the passage, we find some traits that I believe we need to emulate. 
One thing, he was humble. He trusted God in everything and he was willing to do what needed to be done. He was wise in his planning of the project. He was wise knowing when to share the vision with the leaders and the rest of the community as God's chosen people. Then I see some things that I want us to take home with us. When we are in continual prayer with the Lord, our focus is able to be where it needs to be. So we need to be reminded that a prayerful person has concern for others. It's not all about me. It's all about God's glory. We also must be reminded that a prayerful person communicates correctly with God. We need to understand who He is and who we are. Don't be flippant in our prayers to God. We've also seen that a prayerful person is convinced of God's direction. Folks, you and I don't need to take a poll. I love what one of the individuals in such school said, For God so loved the world that He did not send a committee. We don't have to do things according to the world. If God points us in a certain direction, then follow. Be obedient. Finally, I believe it puts it all into perspective. A prayerful person knows who is in control. If we, for a moment, think that the world or Satan and his forces are in control, there's no use praying. You must go in the town. But we pray because we know that the Lord of the universe, the Savior of our soul, is in absolute control. Isn't that wonderful news? He's in charge. So folks, will the world may crash down all around us if we are in continual prayer with our Lord, our focus is where it will need to be. That is the power of personal prayer. Let's stand as we pray together. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this example that we have with Nehemiah. For his diligence in prayer, for his absolute, complete trust in you, and for his obedience to do things your way. Father, help us to be that kind of people. For we understand the power of personal prayer. For we understand our need to keep in constant communication with you so that we think your thoughts so that we act the way you would have us to act. To glorify the name of Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. Let's sing and close the names and grace and teens are gone.
thank you that such a sacrifice was made. I thank you that your mercy, though, does remind me your unending love. Thank you.